morning. Can we tell our worship team, thank you for serving us this morning? Especially Travis. Travis and I grew up in the Church of Christ, and he gets to play guitar in church now. Hallelujah. Come on. Didn't you, Brandon? Come on. Promised land. He gets to play an electric guitar in Church of Christ, and you're still going to heaven. God is good all the time. God invented the Telecaster, you know, as he sure did. Best doggone guitar ever made. All right. Well, it's good to be back. It's good to be here. If you got your Bibles, take it and turn to the book of Matthew chapter 3. We're going to be living in Matthew just for a minute as we get into the Word of God, starting a new sermon series this morning called Three Purposes for the Wilderness. Three purposes in the wilderness. The events of Jesus' life uh, from his birth to being a, being a toddler are very vague in Scripture by intention of the Lord. The only things that we know about Jesus as a toddler and a child is that he was born in the city of Bethlehem, that he moved, his family moved him to Egypt for a time until uh, it was safe to go back into Israel where his family located in Nazareth, and that's where Jesus grew up as a toddler and as a young child. We hear nothing about the way that he grew up as a child or anything about that until he is the age of 12. And every year, Jewish families would make a trek from wherever they lived down to the center uh, the, the center of theology for uh, Israel, which was the city of Jerusalem, where the temple was, for the Feast of Passover. And families would come in caravans, and they would go down, and they would make sacrifices for sin, participate in the... In the uh, uh, the feast of Passover, and then they would make the trek all the way back to where they lived. At the age of 12, Jesus, his family came down from Nazareth, went into the city of Jerusalem, participated in the Passover feast. His, his family <laughs> begins to make, excuse me, his family begins to make the trek back. Jesus stays behind and doesn't tell anybody. He's in the temple talking with religious leaders and teachers about the law and theology. His parents figure out that he's missing a couple of days into their trek, come back to Jerusalem looking for him. It takes them a few days to find him. But when they do, they say, why have you done this, Jesus? Why have you done this to your parents? And he says, do you not know that I must be about my father's business? And then that's the last we hear about Jesus up until the moment right before he is baptized by John the Baptist. Baptism at that time in Jewish culture, it was a sign of confession of sin and repentance from sin. It was a renewing of a commitment to God to abstain from sinful choices. It was taking a vow before God and a commitment to follow the law of God. And Matthew chapter 3 verse 5 states that all of Israel was going out to John the Baptist who was baptizing in the river Jordan. They were coming out to him because his ministry had become famous and people were coming Coming there to be baptized they had serious intention and conviction to go do this because this was not an easy feat it was a two-day walking journey from Jerusalem to go out to where John was it was a three-day journey from Nazareth to get down walking to the place where John was so if you were going out to get baptized you meant it in your heart it was a commitment because going anywhere walking two days is hard going anywhere there, where there's not a gas station or a bathroom or a dwelling or a hotel is even harder and that's where John the Baptist was he was in a wilderness area on the Jordan River now the Jordan River is the boundary between the current nation of Jordan and the nation of Israel there is very little out there there's just a lot of some foliage but it's a lot of desert a lot of just random wilderness area but people are going out because that's where John the Baptist is now, we know that not only is John uh, a relative of Jesus, we know that he was a cousin of Jesus, but he is a fulfillment of Old Testament Scripture that he is the forerunner to the Messiah. And in, in the Gospel of Matthew, starting in verse thir thir 13 of chapter 3, we see that Jesus comes down from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tries to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you and you are coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, permit it to be so now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. 
When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Will you pray with me? Father, open my eyes to see, open my ears to hear what you want to say. God, I want to be receptive and obedient to your word. In Jesus' name, and all who agreed said amen. All right. What happens next after this moment? is absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. Jesus is led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness. Let me say it again. Jesus is led by the Spirit of God into wilderness, all right? We don't know what direction he went, but we know that it is a desolate place. And we see in chapter 4, starting in verse 1, an encounter of testing that Jesus comes up against. The, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. Can I have an amen? Yeah. Is fasting fun? No. <laughs> it's just, nope. It's hard. It is not fun, all right? He's hungry. Now the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to the holy city, set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and he said, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Now, if we don't understand context, if we don't understand the depth, we will miss the monumental truths and power of this scripture. Jesus is led by the Spirit of God into a time of testing. For what? A testing of identity and a testing of loyalty. Jesus is tested by Father God on loyalty and identity. Areas of his greatest, greatest area of weakness. Today we're focusing on this first test, hunger. Something we all work for and we work very hard to get is comfort. We work for comfort like nothing else because comfort is relief from stress, from anxiety, from pain. Comfort is being consoled in the moment of grief. It is being given peace in the moment of panic. Comfort is given in the means of food. What do we call food that we like? Comfort food, right. The desire for comfort is one of the most powerful driving forces on earth. Let me prove it to you. Based the conclusion of so many of our decisions on the scale of comfort. Imagine in your heart that there's a scale. So many of our decisions, comfort has such a loud voice in it. Will this decision be comfortable? Will this decision I'm about to make bring me immediate comfort? Will this decision bring me discomfort? Will this experience I'm about to enter into be uncomfortable? Comfort has a say in all of that. And these questions, they fly through our minds so fast and they answer, it, it, it happens so quickly in a flash. We are sometimes unaware that the filter of comfort is running in the background of our mind, dominating the outcome of every one of our decisions. Let me show it to you. The question, what are, you, what are we going to eat today after church? You're going to base that on comfort. Who should we hang out with tonight? You're going to base that decision on comfort. Should I exercise now or should I exercise later? That's always later. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, that's right. No, that's, that's on comfort. Comfort's got a say in that. Can I have a piece of cake today? Heaven, yes, I can. Comfort. All right. Do I need to help this person right now? Comfort's got a say in that. Should I give this thing away? Comfort's going to have a say in that. 
And then there's our relationship with Jesus and our walk with God. Should I submit to the Lord in the direction that I believe that he's leading me in? Comfort's going to have a say in that. Should I say to this person what God wants me to say to them? Comfort's got a say in that. Should I stop and read and pray at this time in the day? Comfort's got a say in that. Should I stop this activity that is in direct opposition of the will of God for my life? Comfort has a say in that. And often we place the desire that we have for comfort over the choice of obedience to God. And if you're a note taker, that's the one you want to write down. We often place the desire we have for comfort over the choice of obedience to God. Now, before I go any further, let me clarify that this message is to people who have already committed themselves in relationship to Jesus Christ. If you're listening and you're not a Christian or you are a Christian in title only but have no fruit in your life, I need you to know that this is not a message about being good so that you can be saved. We are not saved by our works or our actions. We're saved by Christ and Christ alone. You cannot submit to something that you are not connected to. So this is a, this is a message for those that are connected to Christ. Jesus walks into the wilderness and he deprives himself of food for a time. The wilderness gives us an opportunity to discover how much of an idol comfort is in our life. When the nation of Israel is set free from slavery to Egypt, Moses is sent down, 10 plagues happen, Pharaoh lets them go, they cross the Red Sea. Where does God lead them immediately? He leads them into the wilderness. He provides for them water in the desert. He gives them food on the ground in the form of manna. He protects them every day, but the situation was uncomfortable. It was not ideal, and they began to complain against God and against the leader that God had set over them, Moses. Their lack of comfort and their desire for it led them to give in to the temptation of idolatry even after everything that they had seen God do and provide for them. They did not trust in God because comfort was their God. They're going to serve comfort. And Jesus comes and he is born as a man to human parents who are flawed. He comes into a society that is flawed. He understands who he is and what his purpose is. 30 years of preparation he's gone through to get to the moment of baptism. Seeing himself in the scriptures that he had spoken himself to the prophets long ago, 30 years of getting ready and understanding what was ahead, 30 years of waiting to get to this moment to be led into the wilderness. And Jesus obediently goes into the wilderness, but not just to wander around for the point of being tested. And there's only one area that we are informed about in the testing, and this is by Jesus' own design. Jesus allows us to know what he's tested in, and we got to remember that at this point in Jesus' life, he has no disciples. There's no one following him. There's no one with him. He is alone in the wilderness, and the only reason that we know about this is because Jesus told it to his disciples who wrote it down. Matthew gives the account of this, Mark gives the account of this, and Luke also gives the account of this. Jesus is tested in the area of his weakest link, what would eventually get him crucified. Are you really the Son of God? The answer to that question has monumental con conflicts, monumental ones. Matthew chapter 4 Verse 1, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterwards, he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, and he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Let's look a little bit deeper into this for just a second. Because if we, if we don't see everything... I mean, our minds are about to get blown. Some of your minds are about to get blown. Israel rebels against God. He leads them out of Egypt and he gives them the word. I've got a promised land over there waiting for you. I'm going to take you to it. He leads them to the wilderness across 
all of this area that is now the country of Jordan up to the river Jordan that that is the border of Israel and shows them the, this promised land, the land flowing with milk and a land flowing with honey. Now, having just gotten back from Israel, I'm happy to tell you that I thought that the honey thing was about bees and it's not. They make honey out of dates. I didn't know that. And there's dates everywhere, fruit trees everywhere. And they make this fruit spread that's like honey and it's awesome. And also there's cows and goats everywhere. There's plenty of milk. There's, it's a rich land. The vegetables in Israel taste better than any vegetables I've ever had in my life. Really have. They're amazing. And God is promising them this land. And he says to them, go send 12 spies into the land and look. And so Moses gets a household leader from every tribe and sends 12 spies into the land. These 12 spies come back. Joshua and Caleb are the only ones that have a good report. They come back and say, let's get your stuff. Let's go. We're going to take this land. It's going to be awesome. But 10 other spies says, no, we look like grasshoppers to, in, compared to the size of these other men that live in this land. There's no way we'll be able to win. We are doomed. God has led us to destruction. And the nation of Israel chooses to listen to those 10 spies and turn their heart from the promises of God. And it so grieved the heart of God, God said, fine, that's fine. I'll judge you. You, all of you, will die in the wilderness. The only ones who will get to go into the promised land will be your children, who I will raise up, and also the family of Joshua and Caleb because they believe me. And God was faithful to his promise. All of those people did die in the wilderness. These old men that had the chance to go, they lead their families 40 years in the wilderness all the way back at the end of those 40 years to the bank of the Jordan River on the east side of it in the country that is now Jordan in a wilderness area. They go all the way up to the front. Moses is 120 years old at this point in time and seeing the promised land on the other side of the river sits down and gives them the book of Deuteronomy and he says it. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 3. The words are going to be on the screen. These are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel on this side of the Jordan in the wilderness in the plain opposite of Sup between Paran, Topol, Laban, Hazareth, and Diznab. And in 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. Now, most of those words don't make a sense to us unless we have it on a map. But what we see here is that Moses has led these people up to the spot that John the Baptist is baptizing in the wilderness. Matthew chapter 4, verse 2. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights after he was hungry, now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you're the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So what is so significant about this quote that Jesus is quoting <clears throat> is that Jesus is quoting Moses, what Moses said in the area of the wilderness where Moses said it first to the people because Jesus spoke it to Moses to speak to the people. Did you catch that? The dots should be connecting. Deuteronomy chapter 8, 1, three, one, one through 3. Every commandment which I command to you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land. This is what Moses is telling them. In the land of which your Lord swore to your fathers, and you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. Who is Moses speaking to? To the kids who are now grown-ups, and they're about to cross the Jordan River and go into the promised land to humble you. He led you through the wilderness to humble you. Why? To humble you and test you to know what was in your heart whether you would keep his commandments or not so he humbled you allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone but by but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the lord jesus in the same wilderness that moses spoke these near the these words near the jordan river the place where israel first crosses into the land of promise he resists the temptation to prove his deity and relieve himself from hunger. It was nothing for Christ to make bread out of nothing. It was a snap of his finger. It was a blink of an eye for him. 
His first miracle recorded was changing water into wine. His 19th miracle was feeding the 5,000 with just a few loaves and a few bread. His 24th miracle was feeding 4,000 men with just a few loaves and bread. It's nothing for Jesus to make bread out of nothing. But the temptation, the test to prove to the devil that he really was the son of the most high God. The devil was saying, did you really hear the Lord speak in your baptism? Was that really God? Are you really God? Is God a liar? Prove that God's not a liar. Jesus didn't have any need to prove anything. He's God in the flesh. And Jesus didn't cave into the desire for comfort over the pains of hunger to sin against God. And Jesus went through this to be the example for us in the wilderness, in the hunger and the absence of comfort the truth that God has already spoken to us, there is no need for it to ever be proven. God has already said it and settled it. And if God has said it, that settles it. It is truth. The wilderness gives us the opportunity to discover how much of an idol comfort is in our life. Now, I hope that no one in this room has any idols in their house of God's. There are many religions that still worship idols. They go and they burn incense to them or they make offerings to them or they touch them on their way out the house or they pray to them or they kiss them or or whatever. I, I hope that nobody in this place has any idols at all because that is an absolute evil in the eyes of God. He hates that. But there are idols that are beyond just statues. And anything that we serve or submit to above what God has spoken is an idol in our life. And when we go to the wilderness, we see how much of an influence comfort has become and how much we are slaves to its voice. The master comfort says, don't do that. It's going to be uncomfortable. The crack of that whip We submit as a slave to that. When we go to the wilderness, the voice of the enemy can be recognized and combated with truth from Scripture. When we have the word deep in our hearts and temptation in the area of our strongest weakness comes in, the wilderness allows us to see what that weakness is and to submit it to the Lord and allow his power to come into us and we use the word against the enemy which the enemy cannot stand against the word. Willpower, not gonna work. Sometimes accountability, not gonna have a, 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 a anything, any kind of influence. The word of God always, always defeats the enemy. When we go to the wilderness, it exposes whether or not we worship the God of self or the God of the universe. Because you get to the wilderness and everything is quiet. There's no distractions. And the voice of the enemy becomes very, very clear. And you find out whether or not you're actually serving God or you're serving you. And these are the reasons that we don't go to the wilderness. And if I ask the question today, when was the last time you fasted? Most of us would say, I can't remember. I don't know. Do you know why? Because fasting is not comfortable. Is it? And I'm not talking about fasting soft drinks. And I'm probably going to hit you with a sledgehammer on your toes here. That's not the fast that God requires. God requires the fast that makes you go into the wilderness and have massive discomfort so that you can see how much of a hold the enemy has on you and where his lies have seeped into your heart and where you are a slave to his voice. It exposes it. And thank God for the power of the Holy Spirit that allows us to walk in his freedom when we lay all that stuff down and we choose to follow Jesus. These are the reasons we don't go to the wilderness. We really don't want to know if we worship ourselves rather than worshiping God. That's why. If I obey my impulses to gravitate toward comfort rather than obey the word of God, then I have an idol of me in my heart. 
When the Lord calls me into obedience and I say, that's not comfortable, then I'm not worshiping the Lord, I'm worshiping myself, the God of comfort. If I obey my impulses to gravitate toward comfort instead of standing on God's promises given to me, then I have an idol of me in my heart. If I don't hold on to the promises of God and say, well, God said that. I don't care if I don't feel like it. God said it. I will not call God a liar. If I say, you know what, I, I, I don't. If somebody asks me, John, do, does God love you? Well, I, I'm really not sure. I'm a liar when I say I'm not sure. Absolutely, God loves me. If I obey my impulses to gravitate toward comfort instead of standing on God's promises, and surrendering all of my life to him, every aspect, every decision, every possession to Jesus, then I have an idol of me in my heart. Everything that I own belongs to Jesus. Every minute of my day belongs to Jesus. Every word that proceeds out of my mouth belongs to Jesus. The way that I make my decisions belongs to Jesus. What I do, say, go, live, everything belongs to Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, 4, he said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That word, it is written, that phrase, that is not a suggestion. It's not a suggestion. That means that God's heart has been made known to mankind. This is the will of the one that created everything. He goes on to say, man shall not live by bread alone. God gives us all things for comfort. Comfort is good. God gives us all things for comfort, but those things are of lesser importance. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, these words spoken by God have preeminence of value over anything in this world, especially the things that bring us comfort. Anything that gets in the way of the words of God should be resisted and rejected even if it costs me my comfort. And so when God calls you into something and you feel that nudge to, to jump into something where it's a, it's a leap of faith and you feel unqualified, but you feel that God's called you anyway and you get into it and you're excited about it and then all hell breaks loose and people are getting sick in your family and your car's breaking down and your bank account's empty and all of a sudden everybody's mad at you and people are sending you nasty emails and talking to you bad and talking behind your back and everything goes to haywire and you think, well, if this was the Lord, then it would be comfortable, right? And the temptation, the scale of your heart says, you should quit this because it's not comfortable. Even though God is the one that led you to do it and spoke it and empowered you and put you in it, you should give up because God wants you to be comfortable. That is when you know you have an idol in your life and you are worshiping at the altar of that idol. When the Lord calls you, you stay in it until he calls you out of it to the next chapter. And when the Lord speaks to you a promise from his word, you hold on to that because it is written and God is truth. And no matter how my emotions feel or what anyone says to me or leads me in any direction away from that truth, if God has said it, I'm not going to go any other way, no matter what, it's comfortable. If God calls me to give something away, no matter how hard I've worked for it, what it costs me, what it's going to make me look like in the public, what my family's going to say about me, if God calls me to live somewhere, if God calls me to say something, if God calls me to do something, no matter what it is, if it costs me my comfort, that's fine because comfort is not God. Not anymore. I've cast that idol out and I'm going to obey Jesus. Jesus gives us the wilderness to expose that. And church, I want to call us into the wilderness. I want to call us into a season of wilderness where we open up our hearts and say, Lord, I, I am so distracted. My heart is lukewarm. I'm not passionate about you. I'm just coasting. And there's so much noise, I can't hear what the devil is even saying to me. And I need to get away from it and I need to enter in a time of wilderness where I can hear you again and you can expose some stuff again. I'm calling this into a season of wilderness. I don't know what that looks like for you. The Holy Spirit does. 
but I know that's what he's calling out for me. I've been praying for six days. Lord Jesus, please expose in my heart whatever offends you. For six days, I've been coming back to the God of comfort. Sometimes we need to go to the wilderness to find out who really is the God I serve. Is it me? Or is it the Lord God Almighty? I tell you, anytime the Lord calls us to say something to someone in the name of Jesus, and we think, I'm not going to say anything to them. They're probably not going to like it. They might get mad and get offended might cost me a friendship probably could cost me a promotion they're not going to go out with me on a second date that's when we know we have a god of comfort that we're kneeling down to when the lord calls us to stop a sinful lifestyle when the lord is calling us to obediently walk away from sin and we say no nah, i like what i'm doing i really like the way that it feels and I can just ask for forgiveness. I can change later. We know that we are kneeling down at an altar that we have built to a false God of comfort instead of obeying the Lord Jesus. This is why we need the wilderness. This is why the Lord brings us into the wilderness. So we're going to sing a song. I love Pastor Brandon, our worship leader. He had no clue... I was preaching this message, but man, he can pick out a song by the Holy Spirit. And God is faithful when we are faithless. And many of us can look back on our life and we see that there was a time in our past that we were more passionate about Jesus. We had more fire in our heart about Jesus in the past than we do right now. If that's you, then the Lord is speaking to you that he wants you to abandon everything that gets in the way and recommit your life to him and get fired up by the power of the Holy Spirit by going through the wilderness. God may call you into a season of fasting. God may call you into a season of retreating from fellowship and social groups that you're normally part of. God may call you from stopping a lot of stuff in your life just to get clarity and let the Holy Spirit work on you. And it will be uncomfortable. I promise you it will be uncomfortable. I promise you it will hurt. I promise you it will be hard. I promise you you will regret it. I promise you you'll be tempted to quit and give up. I promise you. But if you look at every one of Jesus' disciples and how he would lead them out continually from the crowds into the wilderness to get recharged, what's he doing? He's helping them focus. What's the most important thing? Submission to Jesus. So, Father, for everyone who's in here, Lord, including myself, who has submitted to the God of comfort instead of submitting to you, Lord, I ask forgiveness. God, for every careless decision, Lord Jesus, where I've chosen comfort over your will, God, forgive. God, for every time, Lord God, that I've not believed your promises, I've not believed what is written, Lord, forgive me for caving into that temptation. Father, for whatever direction you want to lead me, whatever place you want to take me, whatever you want to expose and whatever you want to remove, I want to be yours, your disciple. Jesus, have your way in my life. Whatever you want me to say, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, whatever you want me to give, Lord, I want to be submitted to you. So, Lord, help me today as I renew my commitment to you in Jesus' name. As I renew my life to you in Jesus' name. Church, stand to your feet. Let's sing this to the Lord in a spirit of committing our hearts to him anew this morning.